All right, I think we've got everyone. All right, hello. It looks like we're live and ready to get started. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Urology Care Foundation's webinar on women's health in urology. My name is Simone Gautier, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Urology Care Foundation. I help to support all of our patient education materials and initiatives, which are designed to give patients easy and free access to information on various urologic conditions and topics. I'm very excited to be here moderating this webinar today. For those who don't know, May is Women's Health Month, and the Urology Care Foundation hopes that today's discussion helps bring more awareness to information around women's health in urology. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Our time limit for this conversation is going to be about 30 to 45 minutes with time at the end for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout this webinar via the Zoom chat button at the bottom of the screen or via Twitter at Urology Care FDN. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible within our time limit, but if your question is not answered, feel free to reach out to us at info at urologycarefoundation.org and we'll follow up with you via email. This webinar is being recorded and you can come back and view or share this webinar at any time. Now, allow me to welcome our very special guests, Dr. Rena Malik and Dr. Fenwa Milhouse. At this time, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. So Dr. Malik, would you mind introducing yourself first? Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting us for to be a part of this. I'm Dr. Rena Malik. I am a urologist who is fellowship trained in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. And I, um, I, I work at University of Maryland School of Medicine. And I also have a YouTube channel that offers education on urologic content. Um, so if there are questions that are not answered here, maybe check that out and you, you'll find some answers there as well. Hello, everyone. I am Fenwa Milhouse. I am also a fellowship trained in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, board certified urologist, just like my colleague, Dr. Malik. And I am a urologist out in the Chicago land area. I am the leading pelvic floor surgeon for the largest private practice there in the state of Illinois. And I, um, just like Dr. Malik, have a social media presence, and my goal is to educate and to advocate pre, uh, predominantly for women's and minority issues. And I thank the Urology Care Foundation for inviting me. Wow, well, what better doctors to be talking about women's health with on Urology Care Foundation's webinar in support of Women's Health Month. We're so thankful that they could join us to answer some questions about women's health in urology. So I'd like to start this conversation talking about common female urologic conditions. So can both of you explain a little bit what conditions most of your female patients are coming to you with? Yeah, so I think we we see both very similar types of patients, but I'll take maybe the incontinence side, and Dr. Milos can maybe take the prolapse side. Or um, mm -hmm. so so some of the the common things that we see. One of them is either overactive bladder or urinary incontinence, and so that's basically patients who have to run to the bathroom very frequently or urgently, and they can't delay. Um, they may have leakage associated with that. Uh, they may also wake up at night several times, and then. Conversely, they can have leakage for other reasons, like with activities, coughing, sneezing, exercise, and that's called stress urinary incontinence. So certainly in that area, we see a lot of uh, urologic conditions are related to urinary dysfunction, as well as patients who have neurologic conditions who have related problems with their bladder because of those neurologic conditions like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, and those sorts of things. Yeah, the big, the I would say the big three to four, and I actually made a, a TikTok about this, is incontinence, urinary incontinence, a leakage of urine, pelvic organ prolapse, so things herniating through the vagina. If you feel a bulge through your vagina, that's called pelvic organ prolapse. Recurrent UTIs, <laughs> um, so three or more UTIs per year, very common in women, very, very common in women. Pelvic pain or pain 
associated with the genital urinary region. Those are the big four that I think both of us see. Um, and yes, neurologic conditions that affect the bladder as well. And then, you know, the rare, there are some more complex reconstructive things like urethral diverticulum or fistulas. And so those certainly are things that we manage and take care of as well, although they're not as common in the general population. Okay, so with those conditions, what would be some of the most prominent symptoms that a woman would experience that would ultimately lead them to go to a urologist? Or would they see their primary care first and then be referred to a urologist? Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Malik. Sure. So I, I would say yeah, for the bladder side, again, I think I talked about some of the symptoms already, but certainly it's very reasonable to go see your primary care doctor first and they may have some op options to help you. And if you are not getting success with those options, it's very reasonable to come see a urologist. And it's also reasonable to see a urologist first as well, just depends on what access you have and who's in your area. And um, now hopefully with telemedicine, you can find someone easily, even if you can't see them in person to at least talk about your concerns. Yeah, common symptoms in this group are leakage of urine, unintentionally vaginal bulge, pain with intercourse, pain associated with bladder fullness or urination, difficulty urinating or emptying the bladder, these things. Okay, and so why would it be important for a woman to see a urologist for these conditions or why would a primary care doctor um, refer a woman to a urologist for further treatment? So again, we take care of lots of different things, but there's, there's certainly more advanced options outside of medications, which a primary care provider can provide, but there are certainly many surgical or you know, minimally invasive procedures, even office-based procedures that we have to offer to patients that can help them get back their quality of life. And so I think that's really the key. And also this is obviously our area of expertise. So we bring that knowledge of new novel therapies and, and upcoming scientific discoveries in this area that we can talk to our patients about. But also I think really these are quality of life issues and they're really, really valuable. And often primary care doctors are so busy taking care of you know, hypertension, diabetes, and, and real complex medical issues that they don't have time to address these quality of life issues, which are really impactful on a day-to-day -day basis with their patients. Yes, I completely agree. I mean, uh, we are quality, a large proportion of what we treat are quality of life conditions. And um, they aren't, you know, do or die conditions as I tell patients, but they absolutely can affect your overall well-being. They can affect your mental health, your competence, your relationships. Um, they're important issues nonetheless. I like to tell patients, a lot of people don't think that, oh, it's just normal part of aging or normal part of womanhood or something like that. And they just have to deal with it and live with it. And I find that just telling patients, you just don't, you don't have to live with it just because it's a quality of life doesn't mean you just have to tolerate it. And just hearing that empowers the patients and that's why they should see us. Those are great, both really great explanations. And I feel like that kind of transitions into our next kind of topic area. So obviously women's bodies go through a lot in their lifetime from, you know, their period, pregnancy, menopause, our bodies are constantly changing as women. Um, and you hear a lot about how difficult it can be for women to get an actual diagnosis for a variety of conditions, whether it's interstitial cystitis, interstitial cystitis hormone-related issues, um, urine leakage during workouts or female-related pain. Um, obviously, those are just a few examples. But as we continue throughout this conversation, I'd like to ask what your thoughts are on why it's so hard for certain female conditions to be diagnosed and how that may affect women's confidence in talking about these conditions with, you know, family and friends and even their doctors. Dr. Melhouse, do you want to get us started? Sure. Well, number one, as women, we put up with a hell of a lot. Okay, I, hopefully I can use the word hell, but we put up with a lot more than than the men do um, for too long. And we just are kind of raised in this way to kind of deal with a lot of things. Like you said, our bodies go through a lot um, through, um, through our lives. And 
Um, a lot of our mothers or grandmothers or sisters don't really talk about it. And they, they did, they kind of said, well, we just, you know, keep it moving. Um, and so our complaints, and we, we have to be honest too, medicine is not been kind and still has a ways to go as it relates to treating women patients. They, a lot of our complaints are kind of dismissed are not really um, taken as seriously. Studies show this, that women's complaints are kind of um, more interpreted as being more emotional or hysterical, you know, um, and not really bona fide. Um, I, I, I see this all the time. My women will come in and they've been dealing with something for years, but the men, as soon as like something is a little bit awry down there, they're in your office, okay? And they're like, something's not right, fix this, <laughs> you know, like, some, you know. And so, and I think we, we women do have been not have been taught well to know our bodies as well as the men do. Uh, and even in medicine, the female anatomy, the vulva, the vagina, isn't really taught well as far as examining properly and, 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 and evaluating it. And so all these things make it less likely that women um, have confidence about going to these more sensitive um, conditions and getting help. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that it's very challenging. And there's also data to suggest that women who see male doctors or they're not matched with gender fare poorly, but fair, you know, less, less well, even in non-sensitive conditions, like even with heart disease or MIs. And, and so I think there's really a long ways to go in, in us as a field working on people's implicit biases and how can we really correct those. But ultimately I would say that you know, it's important to persevere, unfortunately, and prioritize our health. Like we have to not just put it behind the back burner and keep waiting until we're too old or too frail to manage it. I mean, I see women who've been dealing with their issues for 15, 20 years, and they're so busy nurturing their family, their spouses, their parents, you know, it, it goes, it goes from kids and then you're taking care of your elderly parents. And so you finally come at a much later age where you're like, oh, maybe I should take care of myself. But if they had done it so much earlier, they would have experienced an amazing quality of life for so much longer. Yeah. I have a good story. I saw a woman who had like severe, complete prolapse for 10 years. You know, basically her vagina looked like a scrotum hanging out and she was walking funny into my office and I and she I was the first provider she had seen, and I I put a pessary in her, which is this plastic device that we can kind of put up to kind of push things out of the way, and um and instantly like this thing she'd been carrying and dealing with between her legs for ten years was gone, and she like looked down between her legs and she's like, oh my god, this is the first time I could like not see my vagina like hanging out, and she was walking like a new woman outside of my uh, the the office. So, really, just drastic example of like how far that we will just hide things and try to deal with them. Yeah, and I'm I'm so glad that we're able to have this conversation. I think more people need to be having these types of conversations just to to normalize the the fact that it is something that us as women go through. Um, and you know, I know I can certainly relate in terms of not feeling heard from a doctor about what you're what you're experiencing. I mean, women know they know their bodies, they know what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. So it can definitely be frustrating to try to communicate those, you know, those feelings that, you know, to a, a doctor to have them dismissed or, you know, brushed off to be something else. So um, it's great to know that there are, are uh, you know, people are having these conversations and um, I think it's really going to help a lot of people. Um, so kind of going off of that, what do you think that women can do when they don't feel heard about their doctor? I mean, I know you talked about like persevering and, you know, kind of sticking up for yourself. So when they have that intuition or that gut feeling that something in their body is off or their doctor, you know, may not find anything to, to diagnose, how can women kind of, um, you know, pers how can they persevere through that? Go for a second opinion. You know, I think if you don't connect with your doctor, just look for another one. And it's okay. Like we don't connect with people. Generally, you don't connect with every person you meet. You're not going to connect with every doctor you meet. And that's okay. Like if you don't connect with me, I'm totally fine with you going to see another doctor. I'm sure Dr. Milhouse feels the same way. And so it's, it's okay. Like just find someone that you click with. 
Absolutely. Find another doctor. This is the beauty of where how we live. Like there's choices. Okay. So you go out there and find another, um, uh, you know, get a second, third, fourth opinion if you need to. And I completely agree. And I will tell patients this. I was like, if you don't feel comfortable with me, I don't want to cut on your body. You know, I don't want, I want you to feel comfortable. The other thing is you can just, if you feel confident enough in some way or fashion, tell the doctor that, hey, I felt like you didn't hear what I had to say. I didn't feel like you listened. I've had a few patients, listen, I've had bad days, okay, where, you know, it's a bad day in the office and maybe I like cut somebody off that I wasn't even aware of. And I've had a couple of patients just kind of tap me and be, you know, either via my chart message or a letter or something and just kind of say, yeah, I was a little taken aback by an encounter. I didn't feel heard. And immediately, at least for me, like, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm a human, you know, with good days and bad days. I apologize. I don't ever want a single patient to feel that way, whether we vibe or not, you know? So sometimes just alerting your doctor, if you feel so inclined and comfortable might, you know, get you there. Yeah, I think that's really reassuring to hear. I know for for me it is to know that, you know, doctors don't necessarily, they're not going to get upset if you go get a second opinion or if you're not connecting well, because I'm sure, you know, some people may, they don't want to, you know, hurt their feelings or, you know, come off a certain way. So it's, I think it's reassuring to know that, you know, there are other ways that you can um, find a, a doctor that, you know, kind of connects with you and fits with you, you know, for um, moving forward. And I think that kind of moves us a little bit into our next questions is in, in terms of advocating for ourselves as women. So how can we as women advocate for ourselves in our personal lives to get the information and care needed in the same way that, you know, health information is provided for men? Um, and can you go give a little bit of insight into why there has been a lack of information historically for women. Dr. Malik? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think advocating for yourself is, yeah, educating yourself and like looking for evidence-based, you know, sources or people who are reputable and you're getting information from doctors or people who actually, you know, are, are citing real statistics from real studies and, and giving you, you know, true information, not trying to sell you something. And so I think that's really important. And I think historically, um, I just think it's it's been a it's been like we hush hush about certain things, right? We don't talk about um, painful sex or peeing on yourself, or it's just a problem with the elderly when there's so many young women who experience these problems too. And I think that's really why it's not that I think intentionally people are not trying to omit information. I think they just don't talk about it. It's just something that doesn't come up in conversation, or it's a joke. Or like, oh, I peed a little when I jumped on the trampoline or, you know, whatever. And, and you're like, ha, ha, ha. But no, that's a real problem and it's really uncomfortable. Yeah, to add, I think we just all need to keep talking. Like this conversation will be empowering to so many. I know um, with my own social media presence, I um, not only educate, but I kind of tell, pay, I, I kind of, I, I want to destigmatize everything uh, we see a lot of conditions that tend to come with stigma. And so I use humor and um, compassion to destigmatize. And I think more of that is needed in medicine. And then even seeing patients, I see this is the beautiful beauty of social media is as you you see these platforms of like even patients that now have become advocates. I have recently um, linked up with a uh, a woman who's been living a full life with herpes. And I did a post about herpes and I, the post was educational. Basically, you know, one in four women have herpes and doesn't, you know, large people don't even know it. And she was like, thank you. I've been living with herpes and this is my whole platform. You know, little things like this, um, you know, just talking and like you're, like you're saying, like Dr. Malik, Malik is saying, you know, educating yourself, using the right resources, evidence-based, reputable sources. The good news is that we have a huge gap in women's health, in sexual health, in, you know, the orgasm gap and dysfunction and pelvic pain in women and all these things. There's a huge gap, but the gap is starting to get, it's first of all being recognized and the gap hopefully is starting to close. 
thank you both for giving that insight. Um, and those are really great examples that you have both mentioned. So I kind of, Dr. Melhoch, you kind of um, segmented into this a little bit um, into the conversation of social media. And both of you have very big social media followings across a variety of platforms. So with the increase of social media and sharing information on social media, what are some common misconceptions about women's health in urology that you've seen shared and that you want other people, especially women, to be aware of? So many. <laughs> uh, well, I one recently, uh, vaginal steaming is like oh, this yeah. new big thing that's supposed to cleanse the uterus and detoxify the vagina. And there's no scientific basis for this. Steaming seems like a bad idea <laughs> from a medical perspective. It's, you know, the heat, the disruption of the pH. You don't need to be detoxified, ladies, please. You know, um, the, you, the men aren't steaming their penises and whatnot. So that's that. That's the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about misconceptions, but there's so many. Um, cranberry juice is a common just like thing out there that cranberry juice is good enough to do anything for UTIs and it, it isn't. Um, what else do you have, Dr. Malik? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, you touched on it, right? We're not yeah. dirty, but there's so much stuff about like, not even just vaginal steaming, which is crazy and horrific, but it's like, <laughs> hey, you need you need these washes that, that are like key lime scented, right? Douches. And like, I don't know. I mean, I've seen so much crazy stuff out there. Like they want you to smell like a flower and <laughs> and it should be clean and dry and like, you know, there's all these things that are your labia need to look a certain way. And it's just, you know, it's, it's just, it's horrible that these are all these misconceptions that are being shared. But I also think that there's less horrifying ones. Like people will say, all you need to do to fix your incontinence is, you know, do Kegels, right? And that's, uh, sure, for to some people that may be enough, but it's not enough for many people. And I think that, you know, giving people that misinformation, while it's not exactly misinformation, it, it will delay people from seeing someone that actually can help them because they'll think that's all there is and it's not working. And so I'm doomed to live with it. So while that's not horrifying, it can have some consequences that may be harmful. Yeah, I definitely know exactly what both of you are talking about because I've, you know, I've seen that stuff on Instagram or ads that come up and say, oh, use this and it will help cure, you know, whatever female issue. Um, so I can definitely see how someone could view that or see that being promoted and be like, oh, this is going to help do this or you know, and I definitely think in terms of like the, the female washes and all that kind of stuff, it it gives females the idea that there is something wrong with their body that they need to, that they need to fix when there may not actually be an issue. So I'm I'm so glad that you guys were able to touch on that. So how can women make sure that they're getting accurate information on social media? Um, you know, there is so much information out there. Um, you know, are there ways that we can make sure that we're getting credible information on social media or should they really be finding a doctor to talk about, you know, maybe what they're viewing? So I think, you know, we are on social media and so there's plenty of very good reputable doctors who are trying to put good content on social <laughs> media. And so I don't think it's harmful if you look and you say, okay, is this person a doctor? Let me Google their name and see where they work and see what their education is. And okay, they're, they're a reasonable person to follow and their, you know, their, their information seems helpful. Like maybe I can follow them and, and get some information and learn something. Um, but certainly if you're getting confused or it's not making sense, or someone's trying to sell you something really expensive that you're like, you know, then I would, you know, get a little red flag and, and go talk to your doctor before you spend a lot of money on something. Yeah, always consider your source and their qualifications and never, ever take personal medical advice on social media. I get, I'm sure you get this, Dr. Malik, like people trying to say, hey, I have this, this, and this. Can you tell me what to do? And I'm like, you need to go find a urologist. I'm happy to be your, your, your urologist, not over social media. I can't, you know, do a proper, um, you know, 
history and exam and whatnot. So, you know, social media is never meant in place of personal medical advice, even as fabulous as Dr. Malik and I are. <laughs> <laughs> and be careful, there's impersonators. So I've had like on my YouTube channel recently, like people are like WhatsApp me and they put a number and they have my face and my picture. And so I've reported them, but like you can't, you know, there will be times where I'm not on there. I don't see it right away. And so I'm sure Dr. Milhouse has had some impersonators. So you do have to be careful. Like if it doesn't make sense, don't, yeah. don't, you know, just. Yeah. And so kind of going off of that, um, how can people in under underserved communities get access to reliable information if they aren't able to see a doctor about their condition or have trouble getting access to a reliable um, doctor? Well, this is a thing we need to fix, right? We need to put the burden on us, the medical community, on making it so that there is access to reliable information for all Americans and not just some people in certain zip codes. Um, but so the burden is very much on the underserved, underserved persons. Um, there is, again, the beauty of the power of the social media internet is you do have these very good platforms that will provide information um, that is reputable and science-based. Uh, I think the Urology Care Foundation is a great source for reliable urologic information. It is tailored to patients completely, and it is free. I have seen on the Urology Care Foundation actually just general wellness, as um, in, um, particularly as it relates to minorities. Um, you have a general wellness for Black women, general, for, general wellness for Black men, and the diseases that affect us um, disproportionately. So I think it's a great start. We have mountains more to go, but um, my takeaway is that these communities need to be invested in. Um, until then, our influence is limited and the burden is on the underserved community. Thank you, Dr. Milhouse. Uh, Dr. Malik is coming back online, slight technical <laughs> issue, but we will keep going. So, Dr. Mellows, you kind of talked about this in terms of, um, you know, breaking the, the stigma with your patients, um, in terms of talking about women's health. I, I think this is something that we're, you know, has been a common theme across this conversation. How can we normalize talking about women's health in urology? Is it just, you know, bringing the conversation up more or are there ways where, um, ways that we can kind of help make the conversation easier? Well, when I when when you say we, I take I take it on from like the medical community standpoint because mm -hmm. I think that it is our duty to normalize this, not the patient's duty. Okay, and so we, the med medical community, need to have more women in our in urology. Okay, we need to diversify urology. The, um, then you'll have diverse people speaking up on diverse things that affect our patients. Um, it's only within the last, I think, couple of years that the American Urologic Association Nash, um, National Meeting has included a whole lecture on women's female sexual dysfunction, which we know that we end up seeing and treating. And so this is a start. We need more people being vocal publicly. And when I say people, I mean those that are here to normalize and talk about women's health issues in urology. We have done a fabulous job of making the public very well aware of prostate cancer, for instance, okay? you There is plenty of information there. We need that same advocacy, the same policy, um, you know, agenda for advancing women's issues in urology. Dr. Malik, I'll cue you back in. So we're talking about normalizing, uh, talking about women's health in urology. Yeah, I think Dr. What I caught of Dr. Milhouse is exactly right. I mean, there's, there's, 
we just have to talk about it in a public setting. We need more funding for research in women's health and urology so that we can better address these issues that they're having, right? Like, I think even despite all the advances that we've had in, in technology, like there are still patients where we try everything and they're still not perfect, right? And I, I unfortunately had to tell patients, like, sometimes you will not be perfect. And I wish that one day I won't have to say that, right? Um, so I think there just needs to be more more funding. There needs to be more discussions, just like the one we're having, and 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 just keep talking about it. And, and, and in all age groups, right, women's health and urology spans the, the, the whole lifespan. So we need to be ta- addressing it in all age groups and how women can live the best life they can just, you know, despite of having any sort of pelvic floor disorders or urinary tract dysfunction. Great. Thank you guys both so much. So now is the time that we're going to answer some questions. So please type your questions for Dr. Malik and Dr. Milhouse in the chat box. Um, They can also be submitted via Twitter at Urology Care FDN. Um, We're excited to have them here to answer any questions that you may have. So we will see what questions there are. All right. So we have our first question from Jennifer. And she says, you each have significant numbers of followers on your social media platforms. Could you please share more how you both use your social media prominence to make urological health information understandable and accessible to all? Go ahead, Dr. Malik. Yeah, so I think, you know, I I try to just answer questions that patients are a little bit hesitant to talk to their doctor about with my social media. And so I try to answer it as simply as possible. Like I'll even use terms like P-tube and some of my audience is like, why are you using that that term, but I want it to be really understandable, right? So I'll use very basic English. I'll try to explain it using like a bladder is like a balloon, right? And, and analogies like that. And so I think that, and it empowers people to really understand their bodies better when they can make sense of what you're saying to them. And the beauty also is that we have the time on social media to expand on things that we wouldn't have time to do in a patient encounter because so much of that encounter goes into getting information, doing an exam, leaving less time to have a really expansive discussion about the pathophysiology of certain diseases and problems. Yeah, I think we both love what we do and we both have a great way of making it plain. I think a lot of what sometimes patients leave the office is like, okay, I don't understand what the doctor just said. And so just making it plain, I'm very plain speaking. I'll say the, I I tell my patients, just say the, just say the word that you would use, you know? Um, And so I use, I say, I do that same thing on social media. I use my own self as like the subject. So I had a video about overactive bladder and I kind of, which I actually also have and deal with myself, but I kind of did a cute video of me pushing my daughter out of the way because I had to pee so bad. (laughs) And I was running to the bathroom. So I use humor to destigmatize. And I think that breaks down the barriers so that patients can start talking. And I see that in the, like the comments I get, I'll get the, the followers will start being like, oh yeah, that's so me. Like, I am like, that's me. And I think it's because they see, you know, me, um, you know, being comfortable with it and inviting them to be comfortable with it too. Yeah, I definitely think that adding the level of humor kind of brings that human factor into it, especially coming from doctors. I think it is probably so relatable for people. And if they, if they're thinking, oh, you know, my doctor's talking about it this way, it seems you know, so easy to to understand. I I definitely think that that can bring that level of of comfort. So that's really great to to have that perspective. Um, Let's see what other questions we have. So we have a question from Nicole um, and she asks, how can women best prepare themselves to talk about urology issues with their doctors? So kind of what, what would you advise them, you know, in coming to see their doctor? I can start there. So um, I would write down your concerns. I do this every time I go to the doctor, like I, on my phone, I have my little notepad. I wrote, I need to make sure I bring it down. The other thing is 
try if you can to use like your actual an anatomic name. So a lot of patients are going to be, and I laugh down there is like the universal word for like anything below the belt, you know, oh, down there. And, and I will ask patients like what down there, your vagina, your, 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 like, so try to be, and you might not know, and that's okay. And you can say that be like, I don't know where it's coming from, but I feel some burning somewhere around this opening where I pee out of my pee hole. That's okay. We understand what that means or my, the opening of my vagina, you know, versus this like, ubiquitous down there um, type of thing. Um, and just don't be, I think if you practice in the mirror too, like practice saying the words, because it can be embarrassing to see this doctor that's got this white coat and be like, yeah, I'm having trouble. It hurts when I have sex. Um, you know, can you help me with that? Or even for the men, you know, which is beyond the scope of this woman's health, but like, I can't, it's hard for me to get an erection to penetrate. I think saying it to them in the mirror and practicing saying those words is very helpful. Prioritize your complaints, please, too. Yeah, I, that would be my, my advice is like, know <laughs> what your goal is at the end of the visit. Like you might have five or six things bothering you, right? Like you might have constipation, plus you might have incontinence, plus you might have over, you know, urgency and frequency, plus you might wake up at night and, you know, you might leak when you cough and sneeze, right? You might come with all those problems. Like that's every patient I saw like recently. <laughs> so, so, you know, and I'm like, what is bothering you the most? I don't want to overwhelm you with all the information for every single problem. Yes, I will try to address it, but I want to focus on what matters to you most. 100%. 100%. I always start like, what bothers you the most? Because we may not have time to treat the five complaints. Let me prioritize because I'm treating priority number three and four ahead of priority number one. You're not going to be happy. I think that's really great advice. Even just for me and, you know, thinking about talking with my doctor, that's helpful for me to, you know, kind of go in with a with a plan and know what you want to get out of it. I think that's going to be helpful for, helpful for a lot of other people as well. Um, so we're going to end our questions on that note. Um, so before we end this conversation, do either of you have any final thoughts you would like to leave the audience with on the topic of women's health in urology? Yeah, Dr. Just, Malik, why don't you get started? Sure. I, I just have to encourage you all, if you're suffering with any sort of discomfort or bother, please see your doctor. Just do it. Just take the time for yourself. You're worth it and you deserve it and you should take the time for yourself. Absolutely. I say this all the time. You don't just have to live that way. You don't just have to live that way. There, there are probably options um, and you can explore them. And it's a lack of knowing that there are options that patients just don't get help most of the time. So you don't just have to live that way. Come and find us or all the fabulous, you, you know, urologists within our field that are helping women. Great, thank you. And as mentioned before, both Dr. Malik and Dr. Milhouse have a huge presence on social media. Um, we're gonna put their social media handles up here on the screen. Um, Dr. Milhouse and Dr. Malik, do you wanna give a shout out to any of your other favorite urologist accounts um, that give information about women's health? Oh, like other people that we love? Yeah, if there's if there's anyone else, obviously we want our, our followers to go and follow you and you know watch all of your all of your videos. But is there any other places that they can get your urologic information that you know of? Well, I love I love Rena, Dr. Rena Malik, so follow her. Make sure you follow her. Okay, she's your favorite urologist. Favorite urologist. <laughs> I love to say that. And then I really I really love um, Dr. Rachel Rubin. She is also on Instagram and on t on Twitter, Dr. Rachel Rubin, R-U-B-I-N. She's fabulous. She's great. She's very, like, she's um, a leader in female sexual dysfunction. Um, she's the head of the educational chair in, of Ishwish, which is the main organization um, that deals with women's sexual issues. Um, so definitely follow her. I'm trying to think who else. 
I would say uh, Kelly oh, Casper. Kelly Casper. Yeah, she it's has a so great good. podcast. It's called You Are Not Broken. Excellent. And she really goes in deep dive into female sexual health and pelvic health issues. And she also has an Instagram. She's great. And she really works hard and like does some really excellent work on the podcast. So I'd highly recommend it. Agree. Uh, yes. Great podcast. Awesome. Um, and finally, do you have any upcoming or past videos that you'd like to recommend for our audience to watch that you've made or been a part of or, you know, anything that you want our audience to know that you have coming up? So I've probably made a, a video on every one of these conditions that we've okay. talked about. Almost, I think every every single condition. So if you check out my YouTube, Rina Malik MD, and type in whatever condition you are interested in, you will find a video on it. So it's a great way to learn. Some of them are reaction videos, so they're a little bit entertaining. And some of them are just me talking to you like this. Um, but yeah, check them out. Um, I have equally like almost everything on my Instagram. I am hopefully by beginning of June 1st, going to have my website finally out so that it can be more of a one-shop stop of where you can find this all collected uh, information. And hopefully Dr. Malik and I will have a joint YouTube ch um, channel. We've been talking about this forever. Um, as we, you know, you have come to probably find out, no, we are, we are colleagues. Uh, and we are friends. <laughs> so <laughs> I love talking about More this. importantly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. First. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so um look out for that. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely look out for, for that collaboration. That will be really great. All right. So thank you so much to both Dr. Malik and Dr. Milhouse for being part of this important discussion on women's health in urology. We greatly appreciate your time today. And for more information from the Urology Care Foundation, you can visit us at urologyhealth.org or find us on social media. We are at Urology Care Foundation on Facebook and at Urology Care FDN on Instagram and Twitter. So thank you all so much for watching and enjoy your day. <laughs>